Okay, my name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. <clears throat> Grateful to be alive and sober and part of a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And thank Chris for sharing. Uh, I love his rendition of the newcomers at an AA meeting. And, and I love the voices you do. Um, <clears throat> um, last night I was we're talking about steps one and two, and, and, and Chris kind of went through three and four just now. And uh, the thing uh, that I've learned as most of my lessons the hard way was what I referred to last night, one of the most important lines in my book, in our big book for me, is we had to quit playing God, it didn't work. Uh, and we will see, I get to see as I move through this work all the, the times I try to play God and how self-centered I am and I operate out of that. And I just want to share a quick story to get going here uh, that I heard a while ago and I've shared this many times. It was For me, it was very profound uh, and a fun story uh, and it was told to me by, believe it or not, my priest. And um, we talk about we're not in the results business and yet I insist on being in the results business. And I usually run into a, a conflict with people. And it was about this guy who was uh, laying on his couch day in and day out, kind of like we did when there was lockdown and just watching Netflix for days and days and days. And I'm still trying to work off my COVID belly here. But um, this guy was just lying on a couch day in and day out and going nowhere, doing nothing. And one day he woke up and, 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 and the Lord's in front of him and, and the Lord says to him, what are you doing? And the guy drops to his knees, I can't believe you're in my house. And, and, and God tells him, I have a task for you. So I'll do anything for you, God. He says, starting tomorrow morning, I want you to do something. I'm going to place a big boulder in front of your doorway. He says, I want you to push the boulder. Push this big rock. That's what I want you to do. He says, I'll do it. And so the next morning, the guy wakes up, and he puts on his sneakers, and he opens up the door, and there's this huge rock in front of his door, and he follows the Lord's direction. He starts to push the rock from sunup to sundown. <coughs> next morning, he wakes up, and the rock's there, and he does it again for 90 days, sunup to sundown. He's trying to put, he's pushing his uh, 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 boulder. And on the 91st day, he wakes up, and Satan's standing in front of him, and he says, what are you doing? He said, well, Satan, the Lord told me to push this rock. He said, you're going to listen to the Lord. What's wrong with you? The Lord is cruel. He's a joke. He said, you've been pushing this thing for 90 days, and it hasn't moved an inch. Why are you listening to God? Listen to me. Just relax on the couches. You're right. <laughs> on the 91st day, 92nd day, the Lord appears to him. He says, what are you doing? He says, Lord, you know, Satan was true. What he told me, he says, you told me to push this rock. I've been doing it from sunup to sundown for 90 days. I've been pushing and pushing and pushing, and the rock hasn't moved an inch. And the Lord replies to him, he says, I told you to push the rock. I didn't tell you to move the rock. He says, that's my job. He says, for the last 90 days, you've been waking up early and working from sunup to sundown. You've been given purpose and direction. You've been talking to me all day long. We're in communication. We have dialogue going on. And you've gotten in a whole lot better shape. Can't you see the change that's happened? I will move it when I see fit. And a lot of the things I need to go through is I put in an honest effort, and then I want the results to go my way. And some of the greatest lessons I've had of when things didn't go my way. And some of them never worked out my way. But what it did, what it allowed me to do is have total trust and faith and dependence upon God for the effort I'm putting in. In fact, he's the one who inspires me to have effort. And so often when things didn't go my way, there was great lessons learned in adversity. Where the tools get sharp at my dependence is upon God. See, it's really easy for me to want things to go my way. They go my way. It's a less need for God. There's an interesting line in our big book when it says, it's talking about fear. It said, emotion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune, which we felt we didn't deserve. How could this happen to me? And I don't look at the fact that I'm operating out of fear. And what drives fear is me, the self. So I operate out of fear. So instead of being in love, I start stalking. <laughs> Any alcohol knows that. You know, I operate, operate out of fear, so I have to tell you how important I am so you like me. 
And it goes on and on and on, and people start to separate from me, and I'm wondering what the heck is going on. And all of that, like all of all my drama, all of my trauma, all of my resentments, all of my fear, all the self is, res- is, is living in this warehouse called the head, which produces anxiety. That's all it does. That's where fear comes from. Where self and ego and pride and the seven deadly sins, they all live up in here. And all it does is bring me misfortune, which me, my self-centered Peter, says, I don't deserve this. And remember my old sponsor pointing something out to me. When I go from living in the mind to living in the soul and operating out of the soul, I take that same statement, and it's God brought me fortune, which I felt I didn't deserve. And the fortune is good things that happen to us like the, cha- the group wants you to be a chairperson. The group wants you to be a coffee maker. The group voted you for GSR. She or he says, I love you. My wife just gave birth to a kid. I just got a promotion. And we go, I can't believe this is happening to me. I used to live this way, and all this abundance is happening to me now. That's called gratitude. Because it's not coming from the mind. It's coming from the soul. In fact, some of us, and I'm one of them, have had some difficult times, some real misfortune that just happened out there. The boss laid you off. She said, I found somebody else. Can't make the bills. All the bills are in arrear. Oh, my God, I don't have the money to pay for it. That's that's unfortunate stuff that happens to us. But what it's replaced it is not with more doom and gloom. What it's, what it's replaced with is an undercurrent of, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but I'm going to get through this. I don't know when it's going to happen. I just know if I keep chopping wood and carrying water, I'm going to be okay. I may not get all the things I want right now, but I'm going to be okay. I'm not going to drown. I'm going to, I'm going to be buoyant to get to the next buoy. I'm going to be okay. And what the work does, this book, it's not aimed at the mind. That's called self-help. That's called therapy. What the book is aimed at is the soul in order to wake up the soul so I stop, start to operate out of that. Because the greatest enemy I will ever face is a four-letter word called the mind. Why we tell new people in AA, bring the mind and the body will follow, baffles me still. We hear that a lot. Bring the body and the mind will follow. Why do I want anyone's mind, including mine, showing up anywhere, anytime? (laughs) It is the troublemaker. Because out of the mind manifests selfishness, self-centered, self-seeking, self-absorbed, pride, ego, envy, sloth, lust, greed, all of it. And yet I try to figure out stuff with the same broken instrument that created the problem in the first place. The very same mind that convinces me it's going to fill the hole is the very same mind that keeps digging the hole. And what my mind does, it creates a problem. I'm kind of sitting on the couch having a cup of coffee, and I'm looking around saying, oh my God, I live in South Florida. There's palm trees, there's the beach, it's beautiful to look at, the weather is 85 degrees, I have a good job, I have a great relationship, my health is good, the money's good, everything's good, this is so good, oh my God, this is good. And the mind says, yeah, but you know, you're going to be 63 in July, you got a lot more road behind you than in front of you, and suddenly it's not good. Now I got to go camping, fishing, snorkeling, hiking, got to be rich, I haven't done enough, I need to do more, I need to go back to school, I need to be a doctor. I need to find a cure for some disease now. AA hasn't built a monument in front of my home group yet. Something's wrong. And I go from bliss to to doom in about two minutes. That's what the mind does. It creates a problem. Now I have this problem. Uh Uh-oh. Now the mind gets in again and says, I have a solution for you. Quit your job. And it gets worse. And now I'm listening to this dialogue all day long. Now when I walk into home group that night, I have to do pretending. How are you doing, Pete? I'm wonderful. <laughs> oh, when I walk into group. And I give you that sponsor voice. I prayed and meditated. So, you know, we, the voice gets low when we get really spiritual. But if you saw me, 
in my in my house and on the drive over to home group, I look like one of the guys Chris was describing with 30 Days Back. I'm Looney Tunes. I have no idea what's going on, and I'm angry. I am wound up tied in a Major League Baseball. And I can feel it. And the mind keeps presenting solutions. We often say, I'm one of them. I'm in my head. Oh, I've been in my head too long. As if I had a choice to go in and out. <laughs> I'm having all these thoughts. I got these thoughts. I have these thoughts. I got these really bad thoughts. I don't know. Sponsor, I got these thoughts. It's the biggest lie. It's the biggest setup. It's the biggest trickster orchestrated by this Satan-like thing called the mind. Because I don't have thoughts. They have me. I don't volunteer to go in my head. It seduces me to go in. The analogy I love to use is if I bought a shirt at the mall and I got it home and I didn't like the shirt, I can exchange it. I can throw it in the garbage. I can wash my car with it. I can give it to someone. It's my shirt. I pay for it. It's my shirt. I can do whatever I want with that shirt. But if they're my thoughts, why am I stuck with them? What happens is the thoughts get in. And then they take me wherever they want to go, and I can't get out because I'm anemic in the God department, so it owns me. And depending on where I am spiritually will depend on what I do with these thoughts. Spiritually fit people, when we talk to them, they have thoughts. They get hooked every once in a while, but they're not going on the ride. They see them. They can hear, you can hear them coming. And they're the first ones to say, I got hooked yesterday. I need to share an inventory with you. But overall, when you look at the snapshot, they're not up there. They're operating out of here. Conversely, someone who's not working with uh, the spiritual, uh, get, getting spiritual muscles, constantly being hijacked. Because when you sit to them, how are you? And here it comes. It's a whole monologue of stuff. And it's like watching a ball in a pinball machine. We're going to relationship, we're going to money, we're going to job, back to the relationship. Now we've got the kids, got the in-laws, and you're like, I need a Valium just to talk to this person. (laughs) So it's this mind that is really the problem. And it overrides everything. What I need to be careful about is, am am I... Listen to the guidance of the mind. Am I following the mind? Or am I listening to God? Because I can easily fall into a part of me that thinks it's God. That's the mind and follow that. Because that's what the mind wants. Domain over everything. It wants to rule. It wants to conquer. And it's done a great job. I landed in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's how powerful this thing was. I remember I was speaking at a, a conference in Minnesota many years ago. It's a, it's, a, it's a large conference. They get about seven to 10,000 people at this thing. And I was a Saturday night speaker. So the room was packed. And uh, I get done in the thank you line, which you don't see a lot anymore in AA, because when the meeting's over, we go into the park and not leave the speakers alone. Back in the day, you were taught you wait in line, thank the speaker for their service. And that's what these people were practicing. There was a lot of people in line saying, thank you for sharing. Thank you for your service. And it was wonderful. And it was a while before that line kind of faded out. I went into the, into the, uh, into the lobby, and a bunch of us were going to go for dinner after the meeting. And as I'm walking towards the doorway and about to cross the threshold outside, I hear, hey, Pete, from the back of the lobby. And I turn around, some guy waves me over. And I really don't like when people do this, you know. I I should have known that that was going to be not a good conversation. And what he said to me was, referring to my talk, he says, that was interesting. That's AA code for it sucked. And he says, I never heard new age, new age AA before. And I immediately found myself trying to defend the talk. We went for dinner. The next day was Sunday. Got on a plane and went home. And I took that guy home with me. <laughs> of all those people, my mind locked into that one guy who didn't think too highly of my talk. And it was a few weeks thinking how I can get back in the saddle, get there next year, and change the entire talk to satisfy one person. We do this all the time. I do it all the time. I get hooked like that. 
That's how powerful this predator called the mind is. And so what this walk for me is, is, is a soulful walk, and I need to get soul food on this journey. But the mind, my mind will be attached to people, places, and things all day long. My mind will take wants and get them dressed up as needs. I want a new car. I need a new car. I want a promotion. I need a promotion. I want a relationship. I need a relationship. Now I'm in the hunt to meet with anyone. So I go out with an orangutan and then complain to you how it didn't work out. (laughs) Wants get dressed up as needs. So what we're about to do, and I just want to flush out a couple of things and get into five, six, and seven in step three, as we know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to step on Chris at all. He did a wonderful job, but our step three is on the bottom of page 62 to the top of 63. That's the third step consideration, and it's got some pretty cool stuff in here. It says how, this is the how and why we first had to quit playing God. It didn't work. If I am not in a place of willing to not play God anymore, then stop right there. That's what I was instructed. How can I do the rest of the steps if I still want to play God? The old joke about the alcoholic who goes to heaven and the first thing God has to tell the alcoholic when he sees him is, you're sitting in my chair. (laughs) And the reason why I need to play God is because I need to control everything. Outwardly and inwardly, I'm in control mode. And the reason why I'm in control mode, because I'm afraid of my life, afraid for my life. I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to look bad. I'm not going to get what I want. I'm not going to get what I need. So I need to control. If I can control, I will be safe and protected. And I find a delusional thought of trying to control and that somehow I think I have control over it. I did it with alcohol and non-conference approved dry goods. Try to regulate and control my using and drinking. And all I did was get worse. It says, we decided hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be my director. My brother's an actor, so I know a little bit about this. The director is the boss on a movie set. I need more lights, I need less lights. I need the actor to do this, I need the actress to do that. I need this kind of setting, I need this kind of scene. And it goes on and on. They follow what the director says to do because he has a vision for them. He has a vision for the film. God has a vision for me, a vision for my life. But I insist on not listening because I'm better than God. I'm bigger than God. I am God. He's the principal, we're his agents. This is an interesting language. An agent represents the principal. Celebrities and athletes have agents. Those agents represent that celebrity or actor or athlete. My book is telling me here that we're about to go out and represent God wherever we go, not just in an AA meeting. This is easy. When I'm in the grocery store, when I'm stuck in traffic, Or when adversity hits, we really get to know where we are spiritually. My sponsor would say when there's no money in the pocket and little food in in the cupboard, then we know who you are. He's the father, we're his children. Now most good ideas are simple, and this concept or idea was the keystone of the new and triumphant arc to which we pass to freedom. When I took this position, he's the father, I'm the child. He's the principal, I'm the agent. For me, I'm a spoke in a really big wheel, but my mind wants to be the wheel. All sorts of remarkable things followed. I had a new employer, and being all powerful, he's going to provide me with what I need if I keep close to him and perform his work well. Now, it says if, a promise or a warning, depending on where we are. It's not that God's not looking to reward me. The thing is, I'm just not listening. I'm not following. God's preparing a banquet for me, and I'm in the wrong room. So how could I I experience God? How could I get any of what God is giving me? And if I'm truly awake, I will understand that sometimes adversity is going to happen. Even when I'm firing on all cylinders, adversity happens. It's life, the ebb and flow of life. And I will get enough to navigate through that and probably come out better for it. And how do I perform God's work well? 
It's a great question to ask a sponsor. What are they talking about? I can start off with what Chris talked about. I'm going to get there early and stay late, even at my own job. And what can I be of service? How can I be of service to someone? It's not my home group. So does that mean I walk in when I want and leave when I want? No, I'm going to get there early and ask someone, can I help you with chairs? Can I put some books out? Or what I love is stand by the door and wait for the white chippers to come in. Because you can spot them. And sometimes you see them wavering, should I go in or not on their first meeting? And they're hanging out and they're pretending they're on the phone because they got business to take care of. And they're going to kind of like nonchalant in the meeting. I know what's going on, so I'll go over and extend the hand. I'm performing God's work well. Maybe I'm in the grocery store. Instead of complaining the line's too long, I could be grateful I have money in my pocket to buy groceries. Or my, my little thing is feeding homeless i got a hundred bucks in my pocket as a homeless person, so I cross the street. No. I can take a five or a ten dollar bill out. It's not going to break the bank. Thank you, God. I don't know what they're going to do with it, but that's God's kid too. Or am I only loving and tolerant in AA because people are watching? How am I when no one's around? See, that's performing God's work well. But I can get so engrossed in the book, and I'm just not a knock on a book. I love this book. I love the mechanics. But I can get so engrossed in this. I go to workshop after workshop after workshop after workshop, listen to 10,000 CDs a week. I know how to do a fourth column like no one in the world. But there's a homeless person, and I walk right by them. Or I'm in the parking lot after home group, and I see Joe who needs a charge on his battery because the cause that I pretend I don't see him. Because the Monday night football is on, i got to get home to watch my team. I'm failing miserably. I'm an AA book, big book lawyer, but I'm failing to live spiritually. Huh? It says if we keep close to him, performers work well. I don't have to get close to be close to God. What it is is an aha, and I'm speaking from my experience, an aha, a realization, a moment of clarity. Oh my God, it's God. There's no proximity when it comes to us in his power. When I was living in an abandoned building, I had just as much God in me then as I do as I'm speaking to you here now. Whether that's a lot or a little, it's the same. There's no proximity. I can't get close to God as if I'm going to walk closer to God. If I do enough step work, God will say, okay, you can come in now. God loved me when I was a sinner, and God loves me when I'm trying to do good. The same amount. There's no proximity. I've heard people say, you got to get close. What, what? I don't understand that language. Like, I know how to get close to God. I, me, a drunk from Brooklyn, New York, suddenly has this insight on how I can get close to God if I do this book perfect. It's a guide to get me to God till I wake up and go, oh my God, it's God. He's been with me the whole time. What about people who would just go to, to religious services and never did the book? I mean, they're not close to God. You're telling me a sinner doesn't have a chance to wake up to God? And when I say get close to God, it's not the walk. It's just the, the, the awakening. If I'm in AA a long time, does that mean I have, I'm closer to God? I'm rubbing shoulders and a newcomer isn't? It's a different kind of God we're talking about then. I'm on a different footing, and less and less I'm interested in me, and more and more in you. It's a shift from page 62 to 63 already. It says, I felt new power flow in, thank God, because chapter two agnostics told me, I don't have power. And that's my favorite line the whole book, lack of power is my dilemma, with power no dilemma. So I'm out, there's a vacuum, and I'm starting to experience this new power flowing in. Something's happening. Even if I can't put my finger on it, something's shifting here. It says we enjoy peace of mind. I just finished talking about 10 minutes on this predator called the mind. How can I have peace of mind when it never, ever, ever brings me peace? There's a shift that's happening because what's beginning to happen, I'm operating. If not here at some point, I'm going to, this is my experience, I've been operating out of the soul. When I'm operating out of the soul, there is no before and there is no later on. I am here with you. I would love to report to you I'm that way seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I'm not. I'm broken and flawed. That's my condition. But the snapshot is a lot better.
And so I'm operating out of the soul. I'm hearing and seeing and speaking out of the soul. And that makes its way up to here where there's no problems on the horizon. So I'm sitting on my couch and going, oh my God, I can't believe I live in South Florida. I can't believe I have this great job. I can't believe I have this wonderful relationship. I can't believe I'm not worried about paying the rent this month. Thank you, God, and I leave it alone. I want to tell people about it. It's a different, a different point of view on life. I began to lose my fear today, tomorrow, hereafter. We were reborn. Reborn in spirit. Unless a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom. So what Bill is telling me now, although I can't pop into mama and do it all over again, I get reborn in spirit. Made new. From the inside out. So to, you get a, a, a guy like me and doing what I was doing and living the way I was living and suddenly um, I get to live a respectful life with some integrity, help people, caring about people. I mean, it's a huge shift. Alcoholic Synonymous doesn't make any sense if we think about it. For, according to my mind, AA should not work. On a logical, a spreadsheet called logical, it just doesn't, Spock from Star Trek, would, it would blow his mind. <laughs> this cannot work. AA doesn't make sense if we think about it, at least from my point of view. How do folks like us, based on what we've done with our life and infected so many, come in, we sober up, we follow the instruction in his book, we get right with God, we go back, make restitution, and now people trust and depend upon us, and we walk head up and shoulder square. It makes no sense. We become pillars of our community. We run companies. We raise families. This is impossible. It doesn't make sense. And we're operating out of a place of how can I help others. And I'm always batting second in the, in the batting order. It doesn't make sense. But in the spiritual dimension, it makes perfect sense. And it's difficult to practice it with the climate out there right now. It's always about me. There's a basketball coach, Pat Riley, used to call, about, used to call it the disease of me back in the 80s. We're seeing it now. You go on Facebook and you got one day back and a snapshot. <laughs> doing my fifth step and they're doing selfies. I'm wondering, where's the sponsor? I got 30 days back, I'm going into rehab. I don't care, I'll be honest, I really don't care. See me when you get 10 years and you're a productive member of society, then I'll have a conversation with you, you know? So I do this fourth step inventory, uh, which is about uh, going in and taking a look at where I was at fault, not blaming others, even for bad things that people have done for us. There was uh, 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 this guy, I refer to him as a distant relative. Uh, around ages eight to ten, would take me in the basement, and and uh, he was he was inappropriate with me. And I had this horrible secret. And I remember writing a fourth step, and uh, it got to the fourth column. Where am I at fault? Where am I at fault? I was eight years old. This guy was a thirty-year-old man. What am I supposed to do with this? And if anyone's been in that situation, you're threatened, and oh, it's, it's ugly. I said, what, where am I at fault? Because the book says out of disregard the other person did entirely. And I called my sponsor. And he was into mechanics, but he wasn't attached to mechanics. And he said to me, how long have you been hating this man? And I said to him, if, he, if I saw him on a street corner, I'd beat him to death. He's just put down hate and move on. Don't worry about self dishonest self seeking fright. We'll flush that out in five. Just put down, I hate him and move on. But if he was attached to mechanics, he would have let me sit in that all night till I came up with something that I didn't even believe to be true. He's just put down hate, we'll move on. So we have step five, I'll catch you. And he shared with me how he went through the same thing. And through that suffering, I got to experience healing in that part of my life. Because I'm able to talk about it, not for shock value, but every time I do that, uh, God says, go talk about that. And there's people in here who've had that, men and women. And my experience is the ladies, uh, bless your hearts, are, are, are seem to talk about that more freely with each, with each other. Uh, guys, we don't want to talk about that. Because someone might think less of us in our manhood. It never happened to me. You know, I got an image to protect. 
almost, almost every man I've sponsored has, has experienced that. It's a secret guys don't want to talk about, you know. And I got to get free of that. So I have this fourth step, and now we, I'm supposed to come. I'm going to try to move here in 5, 6, and 7, and uh, this is what my book says. Into action. Um, as Joe and Charlie would say, not in tune, make 90 meetings in 90 days. Um, it says, having made this personal inventory, what shall we do about it? So I have step four, what am I going to do about it? It tells me a solitary self-appraisal is insufficient. It also tells me uh, if I skip this vital step, I may not overcome drinking. That's a clear-cut warning. The old-timers would say, do a fifth or drink one. <clears throat> I've been trying to get a new attitude with my creator. So if you're like me and I came in here, I was a little suspect of God. I was waiting for him to drop me at any minute. And it wasn't tangible yet. I couldn't grasp it. And I would look at worldly clamors still. So I needed a new attitude towards this God. Now, this is also great. If I'm going through the work many times, I can use it a, a, an attitude adjustment. I can fix up some things, some holes in the armor with this God. There's always room for improvement. And a new relationship with God. When I first got in here, it was a group of drunks for good early direction. I need something newer. See, I look at it this way. Sometimes they come out with a new iPhone. And this one promises to drive your car and do your laundry. And you go outside of one of these, you know, uh, places that sell phones, and there's a line down the block because it just hit the market. I got to have this new phone. What's wrong with the old one? I'm bored with it. I want something new. I remember when I was a kid growing up, you're looking at the remote control on the TV. My dad would say, change the channel. Then remote controls came out. You had to get one. I'm always looking to improve stuff. I have a car that runs fine, the new ones hit the market, I need, a new, I need a new car, when I really don't. When it comes to my new attitude towards God, why wouldn't I want a new one, or a new relationship? Why wouldn't I want to improve with that? Well, I've admitted certain defects, ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. I put my finger on the weak items in my personal inventory. These are about to be cast out. It would be interesting if, you know, I was in, sitting, sitting with a therapist and I said to a therapist, and no knock on therapist, just a, an analogy, and I, my doctor, and he says, here's all my demons, here's all my defects, here's all my selfishness and self centeredness Can you cast them out? In Alcoholics Anonymous, we show up to a sponsor's house and we have on paper all our stuff and we go before God and say, God, can you cast them out? Because he is. It says they're about to be cast out. How much are going to be cast out and how long it's going to take, that's his job. That's his business. But I'm going to show up about to be flushed out of all the things that have been killing me and infecting others' lives. Because God's always beyond my cleverest plans. He's God. And what 4 through 9 is going to do is crush the ego. It's going to bring death to every identity that does not come from God. Because if you're like me, I walked in here with a lot of false identities. The ideas, attitudes, and emotions about everything, about me, about life, about people, on how this should look. And it's not working out. And I'm about to get new stuff put in. A point of view, looking with God's eyes, if you will. And so I, I remember my first fifth step, and I completed the fourth step. I had a, a spiral notebook, and I did it really at, at one point. Uh, it got to a point, I should say, where I really believed my life was hinging on what I put in this, on, in this book. And there were things in the sex inventory I really did not want to put on paper because I know what's about to happen, step five. And so I had an appointment. My sponsor made an appointment with me to go to his house on a Saturday, and we're going to do this fifth step. I'm happy to report to you, up until the last fifth step I did and the last piece of nightly review I read just the other day, I'm still nervous. I'd rather not. 
But what I've identified, the part of me that rather not is still the ego breathing. Because the soul is just knocking on the door saying, I'm here. Or picking up the phone. So I went to my sponsor's house. And I remember that morning uh, praying he got drunk. So I couldn't have to do it. <laughs> he went on vacation. Forgot. Just something was going to get in the way of that. And I got to his house, and I, so I prayed, and I got to his house, and he opened the door, and I rang the bell. And I went in, and uh, we sat down. And he did for me, and I still do this now when I hear fifth steps, but he was doing this already. I didn't know it. Praying before I got there. To stay detached so he can be objective. Because as a sponsor, I can go in and pull you out, but I can't get into your tornado and hang out. Because now I can't see clear. So for me, when a guy's coming over, I go into prayer and meditation. God has entrusted me as our book says with a life and death there. And think about that. A fall down drunk, God says, you're going to handle one of my kids on a life and death errand. I'm going to give you the endurance, the insight, the passion. I will inspire you, put you in spirit, give you inspiration. If you depend upon me, perform my work well right now. I'm going to give you everything you need to hear this drunk walking in. This obnoxious, self-centered knucklehead, you're going to help clean him up with me. So I pray the way my sponsor prayed. And the other thing we do when we hear a fifth step, if you like me as an alcoholic, I will say resentment, Joe, cause, let me explain what happened. And I tell you a whole story. I give you a Netflix miniseries on one resentment. So you go, I'd be pissed off too. So what we do is when we hear a fifth step is we stick to the book. And some of the guys, when they sit with me, kind of, are taken back by that kind of approach. And what I tell them is what was told to me. I want you to read only what's on paper. No elaborating, no explaining. Resentment cause effects where I'm at fault. Resentment cause effects where I'm at fault. That's what I want you to do because I have to assume that God gave you that. And now what's going to get in the way is your ego as we start to talk and you're sitting in front of someone. See, admit it to God, to ourselves, that's not too, easy, too hard to do. Because I may not even be in a relationship with God. Okay, I admit it to God, that's great. Myself, who cares? But another human being, now I got you in front of me and you're listening. And what he has is what I do now is a notepad and pen in front of me because I'm taking some notes as you read. Certain things, some inspiration I may get. Some of the same stuff that's happening year after year after year. I have it on paper. That's crushing of the ego. And I don't even know that's going on. The ego doesn't want to be involved in this process. But here we are. And so we begin, as I did, and I listen to others. They start to read, resentment, cause, effects, or am I fault? Now I might be moved to clean up that fourth column, sharpen it up. I might be, you know, get some, some truth. You know, Mark used to talk about a story. The guy read, my dad was never home. He's, what do you mean he was never home? He was never home. What do you mean? Well, he worked two jobs. That's a little different than never being home. So I have a story, and as I start to wake up, that story starts to change because I'm starting to look in at the mess rather than out from the mess. I used to blame my dad for years because my dad is the alpha male, the tough guy from South Brooklyn. I often joke about my dad, if anyone's ever seen the movie Goodfellas, that Robert De Niro guy, I thought it was about based on my dad. That's how he grew up. And I always imagined, you know, this hallmark card of a fireplace burning, me sitting next to dad, him imparting some insightful wisdom upon me and saying, hello, son, while he smoked a pipe and had a shirt and tie on. My dad was not that guy. And I hated him for it. He didn't know about sports. He knew how to gamble about sports, but he didn't know sports. He didn't know the Yankees batting order when I was growing up. He couldn't care if the Yankees won or lost, only if he bet on them. And I really, really was frustrated and angry with him. Then I got done with this work and we lived life forward and understand it backwards. What else did my dad know? He was brought up in the streets at five years old. He was on his own. And the only people who took him in was a certain type of people. And he identified himself as a man being with them. He knew street code. We've all done the same thing. Hang out at the bar. That's where I get the real deal. 
hang out on a street corner. My drug dealer is a respecting drug dealer. He would never lie to me. <laughs> you hang out on a street corner. It's a code. You have to live. That's what he did. That's all he knew. School out the window never happened. He worked his whole life. My dad worked from the time he was a little guy. How could I fault him for that? If there was another way, he, I'm sure he would have taken it. And he provided for me and my mom and my brothers. We never wanted for much. Christmas time, there were toys under the tree. Dinner time, always food. School time, always new clothes. And I want to find fault with him. And I got to see things differently. There was a shift. Our book talks about prepare to look at it from an entirely different angle. It's a shift in consciousness. You know, when we hear the traffic report, those people giving us the traffic report during rush hour are never in traffic with us. <laughs> They're always up in a helicopter seeing 95, don't take this exit, take the streets because it's all bottleneck. They can look down. They're looking at it from an entirely different angle. What begins to happen to me while I'm writing a fourth step, and certainly somewhere between five, six, seven, eight, and nine, I get a shift. I start to look at my life differently. And I start to see that some people out there weren't mean to me. They were doing what, what they know how to do. My dad didn't set out to make my life miserable. It's, he was doing the best he could. And my mom, who was, a, who was an alcoholic and an addict, that's all she could do. And I want to be angry with her and forgive me for being an alcoholic and an addict. The hypocrisy I walk with. That has to be flushed out. It's poison. It's poison. It's plaque on the soul. And I can have big book knowledge and pontificate to you and tell you how much inventory I write and I can show you how to write inventory and inventory and more inventory and more inventory. And I'm writing a lot of inventory and I want to tell people about it. But I'm still walking around in here a little bit empty because my inventory and my big book has become my God. But in actuality, I don't have a God in my life. In fact, when I'm talking so passionately about the book, am I doing it to convince myself that the book really works? Because I have no God in my life. So I got to see a shift. And so when I hear inventory in the fifth step, we pray. I'll read out of this book. Right up until where it says, um, I don't want to screw this up. We pocket our pride and go to it. I stop there because now we're about to go into the fifth step. When we're done with the fifth step, it says once having taken a step. Now I'm done with the fifth step. We come out. So while they're reading to me, I might take some notes and it look sound something like this. I'll ask, I'll ask the guy to stop and say, hey, you started this inventory when you were 10 years old. Resentment, mom and dad and your brother and your, your schoolmates. Now we're 45. The people have changed. The state has changed. Your age has changed. But the same guy is operating. Do you see, do you see what's going on here? From ages 10 to 45, it's the same character. You're just older. The drunk who says, all I date is crazy women. I meet these crazy women. One's crazy to the next. I can't believe it. I says, well, maybe they are crazy. But you keep picking them. We had a common denominator in all of this. Perhaps a shift has to, be happen, has to happen in you and stop trying to figure out the next right one. And so I keep taking notes and sometimes I'll stop them and ask them to explain what they're talking about. Sometimes I'll, 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 I'll kind of tweak the fourth column. It really depends what's in front of me. But I'm really depending upon God. Now, a quick story would happen to me once. I love to tell the story because it was really profound. I didn't realize how profound until it was over. There was a guy in, in Staten Island, New York, and uh, sitting in the fifth step, and, and I'm, I'm aging by the minute with this guy. Uh, I used to call him Joey Loopholes <laughs> because he was always looking for a loophole. And it sounded like this, yeah, but let me explain. Yeah, but let me, well, doesn't a book say that? He was doing this. And I'm in a cold sweat. And after about an hour, this is, let's take a time out. 
And I'm in my, my dining room with this guy, and there was a little bathroom on the side, and I go in there, and I'm throwing cold, literally throwing cold water on my face. And I'm exhausted after one hour. This guy's killing me. And I, I get on the floor, and I kneel, and I say, Father, I don't know what to do with this guy. I want to throw him out of my house. I don't want to sponsor him. I don't know what to say, but I'm running into a wall. I don't know what to do. Please help. So I get up off my knees expecting inspiration. Nothing. <laughs> now, I'm, I, I tell that for a reason, because if God would have said, do this, I would have gotten a hold of that and made it mine and tweaked it. I walk into the room. I sit down. I take a deep breath. And then it happened. God listened to my prayer. And this is what I said to him. I says, I can talk about it now. He gave me permission. His name is Carl. I says, Carl, all I want you to do is read your fourth column to me. And it was like the deer in the headlights looked like the AA police were going to come out and get me and him. He couldn't believe I just said only fourth column. Don't read column one. Don't read column two. Don't read column three. Just read, I was self-dishonest, so seeking and frightened. And we began. And he's reading self-dishonest, so seeking and frightened. Turn the page. Next one, self-dishonest, so seeking and frightened. Turn the page. About 10 pages into just doing this, I'm waiting for the AA police to bust through the doors of SWAT team, you know. All the big book lawyers, get them. Something indescribably wonderful happened. I asked God for help, and he delivered. Because somewhere in there, you know when you have a, a, a youngin in front of you, and they're counting days, and they're there, but they haven't arrived yet? And then one day you walk into a group, and you look in the eyes, and the eyes are on. They're here. I see it in my business all the time. Guys come in from a detox and they're sitting there for 30 days and 60 days. And they're there physically. And then one day you walk in and bang, they're in front of you. The light in the eyes are on. The soul is starting to get traction. While sitting in front of call, it was as if someone turned on a spotlight inside of this guy. Because I realized how his big blue eyes. Everything shifted for this guy. It was as if he was split wide open or like the fist of Gulliver got down there and ripped out what was in. He was so attached to so many things and a simple consideration. And we finished that fifth step. This guy's never been the same. He was running around Staten Island now with a big book under his arm, sponsoring guys. Anyone who was available, he'd sponsor. And a lot of the stuff he came to the fourth step with have gone. The, 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 the stuff. It's really unbelievable what happened. So it's important that I'm a good, that I'm hearing, but I'm also listening. I need to listen to what they're not telling me too. Because it is a life and death. No one's going to do this perfect. It's not about that. But God gave me a job to do. So I finished my fifth step. And when I first got here, I was... Um, one through nine, it's in 10, 11, and 12 forever. That's how I was brought up in my first few years in AA. And about eight years of that, that wasn't working anymore. I was, God has disciplined me to the spiritual life, and I was writing nightly inventory and going to meetings and spawn, doing all the things he asked me to do, but um, bedevilment started to creep in. And I was starting to listen to my mind, which meant I was starting to have some fear and agnosticism and self-reliance and unmanageability. It's a vicious cycle, and I'm stuck in this. But my ego's also reemerged a little bit, and I'm afraid to tell someone. I, I'm just, I'm not in the saddle. I'm kind of like falling out. Um, I, I'm really not sure what to do. And there was a fellowship of the spirit happening in Queens, New York. And there was what was going about to be my new sponsor was speaking. And he talked about going through the steps annually. And he was very, very rigid. Maybe too rigid for many, but he was very rigid. And a very, very uh, uh, excitable, passionate man about this work. And I told him what I was going through. And I, I says, can you sponsor me? And uh, we began going through the work uh, again. For me, it was the second time. And again, I thought the AA police were going to come out and get me. And it was the most profound experience I had. I remember I did a third step with him and I felt like I was levitating and going through some things and taking a look at a new fourth step, not rewriting the old fourth step, but what kind of got hanging around, the dust in the room, if you will. 
You know, you can clean your house, and 20 minutes later, there's dust again. And if you don't clean for another six months, there's a lot more dust. And then it's just dirty. But I don't see it because I live there. Someone visits the house, is pretty dirty. So I need to do this annual house clean. That's what I experienced. The little plaque that was forming on the soul, and how I was listening and leaning into a wind that wasn't blowing a lot. And I did four through nine with Mark. So I finished this fifth step. And it's really interesting. The first time I did a fifth step, how I was so relieved. There were no fifth step promises yet. I just felt relieved. I also felt like I was that team I wanted to be on. I finally got on the team. I, I can measure up to the other guys in the club. I did a fifth step. This incredible fifth step promises uh, in our book. It says when we return home, we find a place where we can be qu quiet for an hour. And I want to read it to you if I can find the page. Here we go. Returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour. That doesn't mean I'm on Facebook telling everyone I'm going into the quiet hour. Right? Or texting people, I'm with God right now. No headphones. You know, I can't listen to Snoop Dogg and be spiritual at the same time. It doesn't work. So it's quiet. I'm communing with God during that hour of quiet time. I take this book down from the shelf and I turn to page uh, uh, 59, which has the 12 steps. And I take a look at, am I still clear on one, two, three? Have I been thorough in four? Am I still willing to go to any lengths? Have I snapped, skipped, uh, sneaked something through the archway? You know, the things, uh, take it to the grave stuff. Not perfect. But have I been thorough, which is Bill's asking these questions over and over and over again before we go into six. I thank God from the bottom of my heart that I know him better. I carefully read the first five proposals. And Bill, it kind of reminds you, if anyone's uh, faced a lawyer in court or done a deposition, that lawyer, that opposing lawyer, asks you the same questions eight different ways to trick you. And they'll start off with question A at the beginning. At the end of the deposition, they ask that same question again to see if he's trying to be sneaky about stuff. So Bill's writing this to appeal to different types of people and asking the same question in different language. In a nutshell, have I been thorough and honest? Yes, move on. Now, these fifth-step promises which precede this are pretty incredible. Albeit, they didn't happen to me right after I was done with the fifth step. I kind of got to see or experience these things in 6 and 7, 8 and 9. But it says, once having taken the step withholding nothing, we're delighted. I can look the world in the eye. That's huge when we can look anyone in the eye and not be gun shy anymore. I could be alone at perfect peace and ease. I don't need to be home with the TV on silent while the radio's going, on the phone, on the computer and eating something at the same time. I remember uh, watching a basketball game, a, a Nick game back in the day, and I watched an entire basketball game and made myself a little lunch and watched this game, and when it was over, I realized I just spent about two hours or whatever it is watching a ball game. I didn't go to the phone once. I didn't have a computer back then, and I was really okay watching a game on a Saturday all by myself. This was new territory. I needed something, excitement or gossip or just something to keep me interested and keep me away from me. The feeling that the drink problem uh, has disappeared will often come strongly. Um, having had certain spiritual beliefs, we now begin to have a spiritual experience. This is profound. It's that people will tell us it's normal to think about a drink if you're an alcoholic. That statement is entirely true if I'm untreated. But according to my book... That feeling is going to start to go away. In fact, in step 10, it says the problem has disappeared. Not that I'm cured, but that thing that was screaming at me is now a distant voice. It doesn't have its hooks in me anymore. So when I'm done with this fifth step and I'm done with the quiet time, I don't go to 90 meetings in 90 days and, and hang around. It says I'm supposed to move into step six because what I have is the wreckage in front of me. What came out of step four and five? How can I live now knowing how I lived then? 
How can I be present to the moment while I'm still driven by all this stuff from the past? So this is starting to get flushed out. So it says, if I can answer my satisfaction, the questions we looked at on the bottom of page 75, I look at step six. It says, are we now ready to have God remove, remove from us all the things we considered are objectionable? All my column four. And all the tentacles that that has, they're called defects. I look at it, God, I don't want this in my life anymore. Can he now take them all, every one? Do I believe my God's big enough and loving enough to do that? Yes. Can he take them all, every one? I hope he does. Because of myself, I am nothing the Father do with the works. And one day I looked at that question in a different way. It says, can he now take them all, every one? I hope he does. I pray he's big enough. And then I looked at it this way. If I was uh, opening up this meeting, if this was my home group, and every Monday night I come here and I open up, and one particular Monday night, uh, 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 Chris sees me walking in with a co- new coffee pot under my arm and a stack of big books under the other arm and a teaser dangling from my teeth, and I'm walking across the parking lot and everything falls. Chris says, let me help you with that. He says, no, Chris, I got it. And I pick up everything again, I stumble along, it falls again. This goes on three or four times, and finally Chris says, can I take that off of you now, are you done? Trying to be a hero. I look at this statement as the book is telling me, can he now take them from you, are you done? You're dying with this stuff and you insist on holding on to it. Can he now take them all, every one? He'll take the big books, he'll take the coffee pot, he'll take the keys, and I can travel light. I can just walk into the meeting and sit down. People are doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. God's about to do for me what I can't do for myself again. So I pray for the willingness to have God remove everything. Because this isn't about trimming just some of the trees. This is about a, the leaves off the tree. This is about a complete transformation, a complete uprooting once again. Am I willing to do that? How far into the forest am I willing to go? I was desperate here. And also frightened. Exactly where is God going to take me? It's easy for you. You know, you're sober 20 years. You're sober 30 years. You sponsored a bunch of guys. I'm a new kid on the block, and they're talking about revamping me once again. And one of the things I was afraid to let go of was trust or distrust. Because I grew up with a code from my dad and my uncles and all my dad's friends. And they would preach to me, the only thing you trust is the money in your pocket. Trust no man. And they would tell me, never trust a woman. I'm saying, but you're all married. How do you have a relate? I don't get this. Trust no man. Never trust a woman. Only trust the money in your pocket. That's guaranteed. So now I walk into AA and they're talking about trust. Be transparent. And your sponsor, trust God. I can't even see God. I don't know how far into the forest I want to go with this trusting thing. And I interpret it as trusting people. I'm weak and vulnerable. I'm a fool. I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to step on the grenade at any moment. I don't know about this trust thing. And then the pain got great enough and I was willing to trust. See, adversity will bring about change. Pain will bring about change. And I started to trust a little by slowly. I wasn't getting hurt. And then I got enough muscles when someone betrayed me. I wasn't getting hurt. When ready, we say something like this. It begs the question, when is ready? It says, when ready, we say something like this, my seven-step prayer. Well, when is ready? How far into the forest do I really want to go? God's saying, I need you to walk into the center of the... I need you to go all the way in here. You can't just sit on the sidelines, look at the forest, and go talk about the forest. I need you to go all the way in. But no one's walking with me. I'm walking with you. I need you to go all the way in. How much change do I want? How free do I want to be? Am I sick and tired of being sick and tired? Am I tired of traveling heavy? And self is heavy to carry. God gave me one cross and I carry it joyfully. I don't need another one. When is ready? When I'm ready to have God remove from me everything. 
without me being in control. Whatever He wants to take the money, wants to take the relationship, wants to take me to another state. None of my business anymore. I had to quit playing God. Oh, I'll say my life was none of my business because it sounds good from a podium. It sounds really impressive when you tell a youngin that your life was none of your business, but I'm attached to everything. And as soon as God makes a move, I'm clenching my fist, can't do this. Am I willing to be completely put out there by God? Have stuff removed. And for one, in fact, one of the prayers we work with is God, reveal to me the things I can't see before they get to me and kill me. Because there's things in this head that I don't even know about, they're going to just show up and I'm going to listen to them. There's defects of character. We look at the seven deadly sins here. Pride, the mother of all of them. It is the thing. I start to see out of pride, so I act out of pride. I hear out of pride, so I act out of pride. Kissing cousin to that is ego. Envy. I covet stuff. I want what you have, not the way we talk about it in here. I want your house, I want your girlfriend, I want your wife, I want your money, and I hate you for having it because I can never have that. Sloth. Not just laying around watching Netflix and eating bonbons all day. Doesn't sound like a bad idea sometimes. <laughs> Sloth. Spiritually slothful. I don't really pray that much. I just go through the motions. I don't attend my religious community because I have issues with it. But I won't work on the resentment. I'll just nurse that grudge because I'm me and I can have one. I don't really meditate. I haven't read a spiritual book. I study up when I have to go speak, sir. You think I'm profound. But I haven't done anything really spiritually. I haven't sacrificed anything in a long time. I'm spiritually slothful, lustful. Not only with sex, I have a lust for power. I want to be Mr. AA. I see this a lot. We see this a lot when we're on the road. There are speakers out there who will only speak Saturday night, be a banquet speaker, and that's it. A lust for power, I need to be the king of my home group. I need to have a lot of money, so I'm going to look to hurt you to get your money, get your position. Mr. Brown, his attention to my wife, wants my job. It's a lust for power. And so on, and so vanity. I mean, all these things that come up. Pride, envy, sloth, greed. Yeah. I mean, how much is enough? I got a million dollars, I need two. Okay, get two. Now I need three. I have a brand new, brand new Cadillac in my driveway. And after a while, I need now a Mercedes Benz. Well, I need two Cadillacs. I got a really nice house. I need a bigger house. I heard something that was fabulous. If we put on the board, you know, for traveling light, it's a wonderful thing. Traveling heavy is ugly. But if I put on the board, a chalkboard, relationship, health, and money. Put that on the board. Relationship, health, and money. Well, we all like to have enough money for our families, for ourselves, for our kids, right? Security. Relationship, we all like to be in a nice, loving relationship with someone to spend our life with. It's nice. Health, we all, I'm assuming, want nice health, good health, a long life. Right? And so it's kind of objective. It kind of like, doesn't really touch home. But if I put in front of the word health, my health, in front of money, my money, put relationship, my relationship, now it changes the whole game. Now it's mine. Now it's changed. My point of view has changed. My sentiment towards it's changed. Now I'm traveling heavy because I'm afraid I'm not going to get what I want or lose what I have. And I have to protect and honor and, and make sure no one gets near it. And it's my money. I can give it to you when I want, but you can't take any of it. And I need more. It changes everything. Greed. What am I going to do about this stuff? Trying to work on defects on my own is like trying to swim in quicksand. I can't do it. I'm going to work on my defects. I'm going to work on my attributes. Good luck. Let me know how that get back to me in 90 days. Self-will can't overcome self-will. Uh, uh, the carpenter said Satan can't cast out Satan. Self can't cast out self. I need something greater than me to do this. Defects love when I'm working on them because they just breed more defects. That's a defect in itself, thinking I can work on my defects. 
With that, that trust issue, I felt like I was going to be the hole in a donut. I was going to be a weak and feeble and, and take advantage of what has happened as God does his handiwork. It, it makes me, makes us, if I can be so bold, more real, more dependable, more open to share brokenness with you. When we go to a meeting, we talk about what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. Part of the what it was like is sharing our brokenness. And we go, yep, yeah, me too. I drank like that, I felt like that, I thought like that, I screwed up like that. And even when we talk about what it's like now, some of the ebb and flow of life, you know, losing people, breakups in relationships, things like, well, yeah, I went, how did you go? Me too, I get that. Including some of the, the, the wonderful times. So we ride this together. We become more, I become more real, more genuine. And a greater need to depend upon God. I would love to tell you the defects are gone and now I'm perfect. <laughs> oh, the, no, they hang around. When I wake up in the morning, I go, he's up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know if you can identify with this. Sometimes you go to the, you take a look at your financial status and it's a little low. I'm homeless. I'll be homeless in a week. You yeah. know. Because I don't have a billion dollars. When I get a billion dollars, and I'll be okay. Not even a million, I need a billion. I need to have Musk's money or, or that other guy's money. Then I, I might be okay. And guess what? I will get that money and just take my problems to a higher tax bracket. <laughs> because the soul is not where I'm operating out of. And so I surrender these things to God. And when I came out of step five, a lot of folks, and this is cool, do five, six, seven, right into an eight-step list and out the door. That's cool. After the hour quiet time and we approach six and seven, all my sponsors have allowed me to stay with that. Anything come to the surface that I'm unaware of to really understand that God's about to revamp my life again. Because if you notice at the end of the seven step prayer, and I'll, I'll read it and we'll, go, we'll take a break. Um, there's an amen at the end of the seven step prayer, not in step three. It's a body of work of going in. And we're about to step out for now because we're going to go back in again. But for now, this body of work is done. I'm going to take this, even if it's a little awakened, awakened spirit and go out there and make restitution. I've been forgiven, I've been given, you know, uh, what's the word? Redemption here. My life has been in the process of being made new. And I'm going to complete that, is by going back to the people I've harmed, except it's going to cause them harm in so doing, and fixing all of it. And how one of the ways I'm going to fix is not by giving you back the money, but the change, amends, the change that has happened in me, where they can see it and hear it, where I'm not stealing not only from you, but anyone else anymore. A life which demands rigorous honesty. I'm upfront, is what you see is what you get. I have no, no uh, power to do that. It's just God operating through all of us. So my seven-step prayer says this. My creator, I'm now willing you should have all of me, good and bad. So once again, I'm surrendering. God, please take me like the wretch I am. And because I've done one through five, it doesn't mean I'm pure as a driven snow. I'm still a broken and flawed alcoholic. One of the greatest freedoms I've experienced is coming to terms with I'm broken and flawed. I'm the car that leaks oil. When it dries away, there's an oil spot. That's me. What tremendous freedom in that, that I don't have to be Mr. AA, Mr. Perfect. Because if God wanted that, he would have made that. If the thorn in the side hurts, he would pluck it out. But it gives me a reason to go to him. I hurt. I, I, not for me to decide what's good and bad either. God's taken everything. Because the things I think are bad for me might just be helping me. The things I think are good, I'm really good at. That's where the ego will get me, where I think I'm good, by the way. I'm good with this. The ego sneak right in. I am good. Not God is doing this for me. I take credit for it. I take ownership of it. It's dangerous. It's deep water. 
There was a gentleman I knew, in, in another fellow in Staten Island. He was a great sponsor, a hardcore big book guy. He was loud. He was obnoxious. You could hear him in the next building when he, you know, and his voice was so loud. And he would challenge people with difficulty, wasn't warm and fuzzy. And he said at a meeting one time how he was praying for the longest time. He said, I wanted to be more of a gentleman. He knew he was like that. I want to be more of a gentleman, more soft-spoken, that kind of thing. And his sponsor said to him, how long have you been praying about this? He says, forever. He's taking a look at the men God sends you to sponsor them. They're roughnecks. They're tough guys. They'll only listen to you and that kind of personality, that kind of deportment. The mild meat guy, they're not going to go to so God just kind of trimmed off some of the edges he didn't pluck the whole thing out so what I think is good for me might be bad what I think is bad for me just might be good I don't know I'm not in the results business I just surrender me as I am with all my faults good and bad I pray that you now remove from oh I'm getting ahead of myself every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows it's not about making me some super duper AA guy it's about going to work for God he hired me and I grant, I grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding uh, what is God's bidding today well I need to complete 8 and 9 grow in understanding and effectiveness keep me away from me and be be a servant to God or all in need in AA outside of AA I can't do that traveling with defects of character I can't do that immersed in me I can't do that you know in, it's interesting in, in uh, we we I, I said it a million times I need to find myself I need to uh, discover myself um, I need to self-help stuff self-help books Barnes and Nobles self-help the last thing I need to do is give more help to self. And if I'm looking for myself, find myself, I'm looking for the wrong guy. What I need to do is be rid of self. So Barnes and Nobles are going to have a section when they say, let's kill self. I'll buy a book in there. <laughs> the death of self before, physical, before the physical death. The self. It's a part of me that, identi that sees the world. A sense of identification I get. I need, got to have, I want, and that's how it, all the roles I assign me and others, that's all the selfing that goes on. I don't even know I'm doing it. And you say, boy, Pete, take it easy, man. And what's your problem? Here comes another self. So death to self, and, and what 4 through 9 will do is bring death to self in God's way and eventually life to the spirit. And that's when we start operating at a different place. My life has changed a lot. It's not perfect. I make tons of mistakes, trust me. I'll let you read my inventory. But it looks nothing like I used to. I'm not spitting at the guy in the mirror anymore. I'm not one of those junks. I love myself. I wouldn't be that pretentious. Uh, I'm just not spitting back anymore. Yeah. I can practice fidelity to God and fidelity in my relations, not only with my wife, but with my friends. I'm Chris's friend. I don't wait for something else to come along and then say, Chris, I'm busy and go somewhere else. I did that when I was out there. Who's got better drugs? I don't need you. I'm on. You know. Where's the drinking? Go, okay, I'm going to hang out there and dump who I'm with. I, don't, I just don't do that. And that just comes from God. Mm, I think we'll take a break. That's all I got. Thanks.